So Caitlin and I in the recruiting world um, at a company that is designed to help our customers with going out and finding and growing their talent, we think we have kind of a unique perspective in this, this kind of current crazy climate that we have to hopefully help flip the, the coin and help y'all uh, make yourself more findable. Um, you know, with our platform being geared so much around helping our customers going and finding talent and Caitlin and I's role being to go out and find talent, we think that there's kind of a, a different side of that where we can help you kind of from our perspective, hopefully make yourself easier to find for, for folks like us for your next opportunity. And that truly is what we're, what we're solely trying to accomplish with this call is to just help all of y'all get found and hopefully find your next opportunity. I'm sure there are a lot of people who are you know, maybe coming out of school or just looking for new opportunities, but also just with, with recent layoffs. I mean, that's um, with the volume of those, that's really what we're trying to do is just hopefully help folks out with, with finding that next opportunity. So this is open forum. We're going to give you kind of our um, tips and tricks and kind of Caitlin's going to talk to you about building out an effective LinkedIn profile and how to make yourself more findable in that sense. I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about just how to navigate the application and interview process as effectively as possible. But again, this is open. Please ask us any questions. Um, Tiffany's monitoring the chat. She'll jump in. Um, so please feel free to, to real time ask us anything you have. This this will be more fun and effective if y'all are talking back to us. So, and Caitlin, I'll, I'll kick it over to you. Awesome. So first uh, to talk about LinkedIn, um, the first thing I wanted to touch on was building a searchable LinkedIn profile. So I'm a talent sourcer with SeekOut. I use our own platform um, and also have access to LinkedIn Recruiter to find candidates. Uh, Tiffany, you can go to the next slide, please. And... There's different ways that I do that. Um, top search criteria that I typically use is looking up a title. So for instance, we have an open sales analyst operations, sales operations analyst role. I'd probably look for a sales analyst, revenue analyst, um, even business analysts. Um, I search by company if there's some other companies in the HR tech space that are doing exciting things um, or that are uh, doing similar things to us or in different companies, other software as a service companies. Um, I'd also look at industry. Uh, so other SaaS companies, uh, B2B, B2C. Um, and those abbreviations are common for recruiters. A lot of sometimes they'll put in the abbreviation or spell it out business to business. But um, if you are, if your industry has a common abbreviation, it's helpful to put that on your LinkedIn profile, either in your positions and descriptions or your summary. You know, I've been working 10 years uh, for B2B SaaS organizations or ed tech or uh, finance, whatever your industry is, make sure that you have that in your profile. Um, another common search term are around function. So if you're an engineer, are you back end, full stack? Um, if you're, no matter what role you're in, are you client facing? Uh, we have some engineering roles that are looking for someone with experience actually working with customers. So um, that's, I might put that in there to try and find someone who is a software engineer, but also is client facing or working with customers. Um, someone with data pipelines experience. Um, if you're on the sales side, are you working with small to mid-sized businesses or SMB? Are you mid-market? Are you enterprise? Um, so try to put some of those specifics in your profile. Um, and if that's what you have experience doing, but you're looking to do something else, I think it's it's more than okay to make sure that when someone looks at your profile, they can get a sense of like what you have done and what you're looking to do or what you're hoping to gain more experience in. So you can include a mix of things. Um, another search criteria is around skills and tech stack. Um, I review a lot of resumes and uh, one that I got last week from a friend, he didn't have any of the tools that he's in customer success, success but he didn't have any of the tools that he's familiar with, including Salesforce, um, even on his resume. Um, so make sure that you're including those things in LinkedIn. Um, you can even add skills under each job description now. There's a little category where you type in the software like Tableau, Salesforce, Outreach for sales organizations, Power BI or other business um, intelligence tools. Even Google Suite, uh, a lot of people are looking for um, 
professionals who have experience with, you know, maybe it's Microsoft products, Google, it just helps to provide a more well-rounded picture of, of what you've been doing, what tools you've been using on the recruiting side, what applicant tracking systems you have experience with, if it's Greenhouse, Lever, even LinkedIn Recruiter, or a tool like Seekout. Um, and then typically when I'm searching for candidates, I'll use Boolean strings or keywords. I put two examples here of like how I might search for somebody. Um, and then there are other things like location um, that you can add to your profile that will help you pop up um, as well. We can move on to the next one. Awesome. There's so a, there is a bit of a lag from uh, what we're streaming to LinkedIn. So it take like 10 seconds. Sorry about that. Oh, no problem. No problem. Um, so we talked about building a searchable profile and using those keywords. Uh, the next thing is how do you build a captivating LinkedIn profile? Um, so uh, make sure that you tell your story, share where you've been, where you want to go. Um, this is something that I've learned that's been a little bit of a change since like when I first started my career now, you know, with since we have Slack, a lot of company introductions are made via Slack. And, you know, when you're sending over your bio, people put, you know, I have two dogs, where they live, what their family looks like, or hobbies, they like to snowboard or um, kayak. So it you can... I encourage people to in, include a little bit about the personal, the things that you like to do outside of work um, on your LinkedIn um, in your summary. So, you know, what what your areas of focus are, maybe how you volunteer your time or um, areas of interest as well. And then my favorite like tip for right now with LinkedIn, I know when I first started, you know, learning about professional networking, I was pivoting out of healthcare to something else. And um, the thing was to get 500 followers on LinkedIn, like 500, and then it'll say 500 plus. And then you're like, good to go because people will see your profile. They'll know you're engaged. You have connections and you've put, you've put some work into it to get to that 500. Um, so now kind of the next evolution of that is to turn on creator mode. So with creator mode, um, this is a picture of like on my profile, how it shows up. It's under resources when you go to me on LinkedIn and look at your own page, your own profile. Um, go down to resources and it says creator mode. You can toggle it on and it really optimizes your profile for sharing content. Um, instead of just having those 500 plus connections, it enables and shows your followers. So when people send you a connection request, Regardless of if you accept it or if it's sitting with 500 other connection requests that you really don't want to spend the time to go through, um, they'll automatically be following you. So they'll get your updates on, they'll get my updates, they'll get updates about Seekout, even if I haven't accepted them, because I know some people, you know, want to actually know somebody before they connect with them or they want some sort of a compelling note sent with a connection request. Well, this this helps uh, because people will still be able to follow your work without you having to connect with everybody. Um, another thing it does is um, it shows it allow it gives you some insights on like how you show up in search results. Um, so if I went to my profile. Um, I can click in and see like how many times I've turned up in search results. And last time I checked, it showed me the main, the, the search that um, was returning my profile and it was for a recruiter. Um, so that's helpful to look at and just to see like who's looking at your profile. Like, are you turning up um, when people are searching on LinkedIn? Um, and additionally, you'll get access to other tools uh, like newsletters and LinkedIn Live like we're doing today. I think one final thing is when you turn creator creator mode on um, and it shows like your followers, your connections, it's a real easy thing to do to make your profile stand out or to make it look like you're really engaged in LinkedIn. You know, like posting content is another piece, but it's an easy button to actually like take your profile up a notch and then, you know, sharing more content can come later. And on the next slide, lastly, 
I wanted to touch on contributing to the LinkedIn community. So the easy part, turn on creator mode, you know, add on some of those keywords and then the what seems to many is the hardest part, but I think it can be easy if you just start out um, small, um, is to contribute regularly to the LinkedIn community. So set a weekly calendar reminder to post and engage with content. You don't always have to write original content. You can like. You can like other people's posts. I recommend commenting. You know, I think that's a better way to engage and show people that, you know, you're interested in what they have to say and network um, and give kudos freely. You know, when people do post their their wins or their exciting life announcements, I love commenting and saying, like, congrats. Um, my, one of my friends, Nakwana, just um, took over as president of a, a nonprofit board here. So congrats, Nakwana. So, like, so glad to see this update. Um, it's, it takes your engagement to the next level other than just liking posts. So I recommend doing a mix, like, comment, post, um, and then make sure that you're following profiles that seem authentic to you. Um, uh, follow different profiles so you see what they're doing. You know, people have different styles for posting on LinkedIn. Maybe they're, they're doing polls. Those are popular, um, and fun to practice with, see what your network has to say about different topics, even inform some of the work you're doing professionally, um, or post um, short form, long form, write an article on LinkedIn. There's lots of ways to engage. And that wraps up my piece on LinkedIn. I'll add one more thing. Um, I like to say lead with LinkedIn. Because when recruiters are reviewing your applicant application, it's an easy place for them to go and see a quick summary of your activity, get more details on the company you're working at. Um, but the same thing goes for, for resumes. I would just make sure that you're including, you know, bullets under your um, your positions that are pretty succinct and get to the point and also share metrics. Um, definitely want some numbers in there. You know, how many clients are you supporting? How were you able to redu reduce churn? Were you able to add X amount to the top line revenue? Uh, were you able to grow uh, the company's followers for their page? Whatever your impact is, definitely tell that story um, and make sure that it's uh, readable easily. Uh, the recruiter can easily grab, you know, the pieces of information from there. Um, and it has a nice, like, a nice... Um, I don't want to say user experience, but a nice flow um, because LinkedIn is definitely um, an easier read compared to looking at uh, if you're reviewing a bunch of applications, looking at all the different resumes that people send up in in different formats. Yeah, no, that's such a good point. It's a, and we'll we'll kind of touch on that a little in a little bit, but yeah, I mean, really, your resume and LinkedIn profile is kind of like your foot first foot forward. So yeah, the the easier it is to read, the more information it has, and and really thinking about it from a lens of like it's. It's presenting your technical experience and the his history of your background. We obviously, as recruiters and hiring folks, want to hear kind of the story from you and kind of fill in the pieces, but um, definitely getting that just upfront, like very easy to digest version of what you've done, what you're capable of doing. Um, that's what, what what we're always looking for as recruiters. So yeah, um, Andy, one you. quick oh, yeah, one thanks. quick question while you're talking about resumes. Um, when you're looking at resumes, and recruiting for recruiters, um, what what things would stand out to you or what would you be looking for? Any general advice um, for people in the TA space? Yeah, so I would say that the, the biggest things that I would be looking for would be um, whether or not you're working on technical or business functions, or if you're outside of like the tech world, if you're in healthcare or, um, you know, the industrial space or aerospace or anything like that really just dis being distinct about what types of roles you're working on because the recruiter is kind of a blanket statement that's like saying salesperson um you know there's there's multitudes of different people that work in different spaces as recruiters so specifying like what types of folks that you've been recruiting so whether that's engineers software engineers um uh, nurses doctors uh, you can also even kind of spin it over to like sales so like myself I solely recruit for basically business functions so my entire career has been like finance, HR, IT, sales, customer success, things like that. So specifying that piece, um, number of active uh, roles that you typically worked on. Um, if you know off the top of your head, I certainly don't. Um, like how many people you've actively recruited into your organization. I always think that's a great stat. Um, and then I think that the the common uh, 
terms that are always brought up are around like time to fill and things of that nature. But I think that a lot of recruiting organizations are getting away from that, but still having that information is beneficial. And then also a new one is just that recruiting is getting more and more into the space of using data as an ally. So talking about what you've done from a data perspective in your resume is, is super beneficial to say like, Hey, I built out dashboards within Tableau to kind of show like what our um, what our uh, recruiting efforts have yielded and things like that. Um, anything that you can reference data from a recruiting perspective is is super beneficial. So um, hopefully that answers the question. But um, no, so with with what Caitlin shared with us, so you've got this great LinkedIn profile. You've built up your presence. You, you're you're a certified pro with LinkedIn now. So you're starting to look for your next opportunity and actively applying. And so the, the biggest thing that I always tell folks when they're when they're looking for new opportunities is to be deliberate. And I'm gonna probably say that a hundred times, so apologies in advance. Um, but being deliberate in your search is so crucial from a from a job application standpoint. I think the the stigma has always been like just apply to a bunch of roles. That's how you get interviews. But with the amount of information that we have at our our fingertips now, it's just not the most effective way to do it. Like I know when I got laid off back in June, I was I was actually had on PTO when I got laid off. When I got back, I applied to like 30 jobs that night. I think I got two interviews out of it. Um, and it's just really not the most effective way to navigate the job search to just kind of the, the, the phrase we say a lot in recruiting is apply and pray. And really, there's so much more of an effective way to kind of narrow in your search and be a lot more deliberate. I would say that using a job board for application versus actively searching for an opportunity is the equivalent of like, if you just clicked on every single Instagram ad you ever had versus actively going out and finding something that you wanted. Like, sure, if you just kind of keep clicking on Instagram ads, odds are you're going to find something you like. But if you actively search for the thing that you're trying to find, it's going to be a lot, it's a little bit more legwork, but certainly going to be more successful. So um, what I mean by job boards is going to be like the the jobs tab on LinkedIn, or if you go on In Indeed, or even Glassdoor has a, has a job board function on there. If you're using that and just going on there and applying to every job that the title aligns to what you've done, it's really not going to be as successful as kind of being very deliberate and pointed with your search. And from a searching standpoint, what I mean by that is honing in on kind of what you're looking for. So first and foremost, looking at titles. And the biggest thing is that not every title is the same. Not all not all companies use the same language when it comes to titles. You know, it's if things can be as wild as you know, in one organization you're like a sales representative, in one you're a customer success person, um, and then it can also be as rudimentary as like software developer versus software development engineer um, or SDE. So you know, you can kind of there's so many different synonyms to what you've been doing or what you're looking to do next. So first go look up kind of what comparable job titles are, you know, search within Google or even that's kind of a useful function to use the job boards for us to kind of go find comparable titles of like, Hey, you know what? I could probably do this job because I checked, you know, a couple of the boxes on the, the job description. So I'm going to go look for positions that are comparable to this one as well. And not just resting your hat solely on what your previous title has been. So finding a couple of different titles to have in your back pocket for your search is key because again, it's just, it's not the same language across every company. Then going in more deeply to searching for companies themselves. And the big thing is, is that, you know, LinkedIn, Indeed, Google, all of these platforms, they're, they're search engines. So you, at the end of the day, so even with the job search function, so companies can pay for search engine optimization to get their jobs listed higher. Some really great companies might not be able to afford for any type of like posting on a LinkedIn or an Indeed. They might just have it on their careers page. So you can't rely solely on those job boards as the single source of truth. So going and finding companies in your industry. So if you're in healthcare, go look for like some of the top companies within your space. Um, if you're in tech, look up some of the fastest growing companies in your area or even, you know, nationally, because you, we're getting so much more remote, you don't necessarily have to confine it to just your geography, but doing those searches to find companies where you can kind of build up a roster, you go on Glassdoor and see some of the highest rated companies in terms of like employee satisfaction or CEO satisfaction or whatever, and making that list of organizations and go to their individual careers pages. I mean, a, a prime example of this is 
I found the opportunity of, at Seekout by way of uh, network connections. I didn't see the job. And when I was applying to like 30, 40, 50 different roles, I didn't see the opportunity at Seekout. I found it from a network connection. So you can't rely solely on those pages to, to deliver what you're looking for. So narrowing down the companies and being able to go onto their actual careers page to find those opportunities, it, it's, it's just going to open up a lot more opportunities for you. So doing that front end research, sure, it's a bigger lift than just going on to LinkedIn and typing in software engineer and just firing off applications. But wouldn't you rather do one application and get an interview than do 30 and get two? I mean, I think that's pretty straightforward math. But um, And then lastly, again, just continue to use multiple sources. I'm not saying don't use these job boards, but be, being more intentional with your search is going to deliver a little bit more of a one-to-one -one result, hopefully. So, Andy, um, yeah. as a recruiter, like, what are your sentiments on a candidate messaging the job poster hiring manager on LinkedIn after they've applied? Great More question. The next slide is effective. actually going to address that. So that's a great question. Uh, so you'll see it there in the second little section. We'll talk about that. So um, networking and outreach. So Caitlin kind of already addressed it a little bit with just LinkedIn is such an amazing tool from a networking perspective. And I think that, you know, not to be overly blunt, but if you're applying for a job and you're not trying to tap into your network in some way, shape or form, once you have, it is a huge missed opportunity. And what I mean by that is, so you apply for a position, then you go look up that company page on LinkedIn, see who you're already connected with. So there might be people that you've worked with previously. You might have friends or family that even work there. That's happened to me before where I found out like my cousin worked at a company and I didn't reach out to them before I got the job. I was scolded at Thanksgiving. Um, so doing that research to find these people and we as recruiters and as companies, we, we do a lot of things to mitigate bias to where we're not just solely relying on referrals and recommendations for applying because you know, diversity is not just DEIB. It's also you want to look at diversity of thought, diversity of experience, diversity of what types of companies people are coming from. So we don't want to solely rely on that. But if you apply for a job and then you go and reach out to somebody that you're connected with and say like, hey, I would love to just learn more about the company from your perspective, you know, very candidly, um, would love for you to maybe pass along a recommendation to the hiring manager if you're comfortable, would love for you to share with me who the hiring manager or recruiter is that I could reach out to directly. You, those are just such great opportunities to connect. And I'm going to say the word visibility probably 50 times on this slide, where it just helps with your visibility. And so doing that outreach is so beneficial. On top of that, be creative with your networking. You know, you don't have to just have that that solid line between you and somebody at the company. It's like if you see that if you're applying for a sales job and you see the director of sales at that company is connected to somebody you know, reach out to that person and say, like, hey, how well do you know that person? Could you get me in touch with them? Would you be comfortable passing along a recommendation on my behalf? Uh, you know, anything that you can do to just kind of get that barrier down of the, the social media outreach and kind of just like cold call style, like anything to soften that wall um, is really, really effective. So be creative in that outreach. Um, and then, yeah, connecting on LinkedIn with recruiting professionals, company leaders, connecting with them first and foremost, I would highly, highly recommend. Um, again, it helps with visibility. It's one of those things where if I see you connecting with me on LinkedIn, and then I go and start looking for your, your, and I start looking through job applications and your name rings a bell in my head. That's just one other way for you to kind of be noticed. And it's one of those things where we do our best as recruiters to try to reach out to every single person that applies. But it's also, you know, we have positions where we get 100, 200 applicants to, and it's just not realistic. I mean, we're human beings. There's only so many hours in the day. So we try to reach out to everybody. But if you can kind of continue to be at the forefront of our headspace, you know, that's just going to increase your probability of getting that initial response and that initial conversation, which is ultimately what we're trying to do with these outreaches. And then reaching out to people by way of like me messaging them on LinkedIn is, I would say there's no harm in it by any means, but it is going to be kind of a flip of the coin of if it's going to actually be effective for you. Because when you reach out to a manager or a recruiter, you know, there's odds that that manager might not necessarily be tied to the hiring process, or maybe they're just very removed from the process. And it's kind of more the recruiter show. You might reach out to somebody with a recruiter title at the company that's not working on that job in any way, shape or form. 
So I would say if anytime you're doing an outreach to somebody who you think is actively involved in the role that you're applying for, leading the message of just like a, hey, connect with them first and saying like, hey, thanks so much for connecting with me. Would love just five to 10 minutes of your time to talk a little bit more about the company and the role. If you're not the right person to talk to, I would really appreciate if you could point me in the right direction. Super simple, not a huge ask, not a huge lift. And if you're reaching out to the right person, it, it, it'll it get you that, that foot in the door. Um, I will say the biggest thing with all of this is apply first. Number one, two, and three, apply first because either we're going to ask you to do it anyway, or it's going to make things a lot faster for us to find you. So, you know, if you reach out to somebody in your network, they reach out to us and they're like, hey, so-and-so applied. They're great. And I'm like, okay, awesome. Who's so-and-so? I've never heard of this person. I haven't seen their resume, their LinkedIn, anything like that. If you give us, if you apply, that just it makes it a little bit faster for us to find you, reach out to you. If I get a ping from somebody in our company that's like, hey, Caitlin's great. You should talk to her. I'll be able to email her right away if if you've already applied for the job. So I was going to, I think that's right. But I also think like if the company doesn't have a role that you're interested in, then proactively reach out to people. I just put a message in the chat like, hey, hey, Andy, love the work you're doing at Seek Out. Seek Out's on my radar for future opportunities. I'd like to keep in touch. So, like, I think that's good to be proactive Perfect. about it. Um, but if you are interested in a spe specific role, def definitely apply so they can just look and like see that it's already, you know, that you're they can find your application. Absolutely. And that's kind of a great transition to, to kind of the, the next bullet point here is being really deliberate with your outreach. So that's why I say in the in the previous slide of, of searching for these companies that you have active interest in, like attend meetups, go to webinars, go to virtual events. Like if you're interested in Seek Out and you haven't necessarily applied in an opportunity and you're on this call, this is a great way to kind of put your foot forward and get on our radar so that when there are a there is a position that's open that aligns with your background or what you're looking for, we can recognize your name. So uh, uh, doing as much as you can as far as just creating that visibility, making yourself more approachable for the recruiters within those companies that you're interested in, it, it'll just help expedite the process and, and hopefully get your foot in the door. So. And I just added, Andy, too, if there, you have a target company list, um, look look up who the company competitors are, because, you know, maybe there is an up and com coming uh, yeah. company in that area or, you know, other companies you haven't even heard of that are doing similar work or, you know, something that's related that you might be interested in, too. Absolutely. I know we talked about um, reaching out to the hiring manager for a role and um, finding them on LinkedIn. Do you have any tips for um, finding the the team members or the hiring managers or the recruiters for a specific role? Yeah, so so good question. So recruiters is going to be a little tricky because you have to kind of filter through like the tech recruiter, non-tech recruiter kind of uh, segmentation within the teams. But from a hiring manager perspective, you know, you can, if you're applying for a sales job, you can go onto LinkedIn, you can go onto the company page, you can go onto the, so you go to company page and then you go to people and you can search titles. So if you're applying for like a communications position, just go to that, type in communications and connect with everybody that has that title. Um, if there's somebody that has like that director level title, you know, connect with them and maybe send them a really nice note one, if, they've, if they accept your, your connection. So it, it's, it's tricky, but it's one of those where again, it doesn't hurt. And if you can navigate LinkedIn effectively, it takes all of like three minutes to go find these folks and just shoot them a quick note. Um, and then also, I, I forgot to mention peers as well. I think people often overlook that piece. Look up people with the exact same title of the position that you're applying for. Reach out to them and say like, hey, would love to just pick your brain and see if this is an interesting opportunity for, for me. And if you think I would be a good fit. Peers will build, will be very receptive to that because you know they're they're often not directly involved in the hiring process. So being able to engage with them of just like, hey, give me kind of the scoop. Like, is this something that that would be a good fit? Um, is another really effective way. So that's a good point uh, because some companies too, it's not all referrals. They also accept leads. So if somebody reached out to me at about a role and I don't know them, but they told me they're interested, I could submit them as a lead. And, you know, hopefully, you know, increase the visibility of their application yeah. um, to the recruiting team. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Uh, we can go to the next slide, Tiffany, if you don't mind. 
All right. So we've got the LinkedIn profile. We've done the applying. We've done the outreach. So now getting ready for the actual interviews. Um, and this is the thing that I preach the most to any of my friends, family, anybody who's applying for jobs is do research. The more, the better. Do it early. Do it often. And I think that the misconception is that when you get a conversation with a recruiter, that that's kind of like the exploratory conversation. That's not the case. I, I want to squash that as hard as I can right now. It, when you come into that recruiter conversation, if you've done research on the company and you ask us really good questions and things like that, that's um, that's the fastest way to my heart. Um, so if you ask me those really good questions and I can tell that you're really excited about it, our call is going to go so much better. And it, in fact, it's to the extent of when I'm having my conversations with candidates, I typically maybe only spend like 10 minutes asking them questions because again, it's you have, you have a built well built out LinkedIn or resume, I get the picture of like what you've done. And the reason I reached out to you is because I think you potentially be a good fit. Now I just need to fill in those gaps with your story and want to answer questions that you have and kind of sell you on the opportunity in the company. So if you come to the conversation with me with a lot of really good questions, then that conversation is going to go really well. If you go question. into that conversation, oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Andy, question. So I like to cheat on this, like, Yes, it's good that you do research. You should know the mission, but I'm sure there are a couple questions that come to mind that somebody could virtually ask to any company that is like a good question. Can you think, does anything come to mind? Yeah, I mean, I would say the big three would be, um, uh, what do you like about the company? Um, how do you feel about the company culture? And um, something about the, what are the biggest opportunities and challenges for the business? I think that is like a, you know, if you get an interview same day and you didn't get enough time to do research, those questions, you're going to get the information that you need to feel comfortable if it's going to be the right company for you. And also it's going to help open me up to give you some good information that I wouldn't necessarily just start throwing at you unprompted. So I think those are really good three questions. So again, just company culture, um, biggest challenges and opportunities in the future and what I like about the company. If I get asked those three questions every time, then I'm going to be a thumbs up, but more honed in ones are going to create a better conversation. And, and to kind of lead into that. So coming with questions ready is so pivotal for every facet of the, the interview process. So when you come talk to the hiring manager, don't just ask those three generic questions that I just listed. Research the person that you're talking to, look at their career development, um, research the company, like what the product does. If you can do like a sample of the product, or if you can get as much information as you can from the website, like do it. Because if you go into that conversation with the hiring manager and you're asking really pointed questions, like, Hey, what are some projects that your team's working on? Or, Hey, how do you interact with this facet of the organization or anything in that space? That's going to just create a much more effective dialogue with, with the hiring manager and then going into the interview loop as well. Those are, those are huge things to prep for. Uh, Tiffany, were you raising your hand? Yeah. When you say uh, do research on a company, like what if the company is like very well known, like a like an Apple, like what are some tips on doing research? So you said research on the person. A lot of times people don't have a lot of like their projects listed on LinkedIn, right? Do you have any tips for like what kind of research people can do, especially if it's like a a company that everyone knows where, um, like, yeah. Yeah. No, great question. Um, Caitlin, I would love to hear your input on this too, but I think that the biggest thing that I would say is larger companies, they, so you think about like the Amazons, the Microsofts, the Googles of the world, their smaller teams are kind of like companies in themselves. So you can do research on the individual segments of an organization and it not just be like, oh yeah, I know what Amazon is. It's a it's an e-commerce website. It's like, no, what is the specific team that you're talking to? Like if you're interviewing with AWS, go research AWS and ideally even like get more zoomed in on that where you look up the person that you're talking to. Like, what are some people, what are, what are some of the things that they have on their LinkedIn profile? Um, maybe you can do some research about their team in particular. Like if it says, you know, manager of so-and-so, you can get kind of zoomed in to at least to a degree so you can come into the conversation with good questions of like, hey, what are you working on? What is your team working on? How does it align to the bigger picture kind of thing? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, perfect. And then kind of on that, in that same vein, 
getting ready for your interview, come ready with examples. And what I mean by examples is having stories about you to help answer interviewer questions. And I capitalize you because I mean, have them be about you. I think that a lot of people have a tendency to be very humble and very modest, and it's a great attribute. But when you're interviewing, we're trying to hear what you did and what you're doing. So you saying like, yeah, my team did this, my team did that, like that's great in the business sense. But when you're talking about an interview, we're trying to see the evidence of like what you contributed and what the result was of your contribution. So making sure that you have these very specific, concise examples from your background to kind of help answer these questions and jot them down. I mean, often you can pivot your examples to answer different questions. Like you could use a, the same example to answer, like, tell me about a time that you failed with also tell me about a time that you were really successful. You could use the same example. You just have to spin it a different way. So having those examples ready to go throughout your career, like if you use the same example over and over and over again, it's not going to give a good picture of just what you've done. You know, if you've been working for 10, 15 years and you only have two examples, it's like, okay, well, what, what were you doing that whole time? I would love to hear more about that. And I wrote in here the STAR method. I, I'm sure everybody has heard about this. If you haven't, it means um, situation, task, action, result. Um, using that as your framework when you're answering questions and also building out your examples, like talk about, hey, what was the situation? What was the task at hand? What was my action in this? And what was the result of that action? That's the best way to go in with your, your answers to questions. So coming to your interviews with, with number one, having kind of like a two to three minute elevator pitch just about you and your background, have that ready to go, have some examples jotted down about just what, about your background that can be used to answer some questions, and then also have those questions ready to go. And again, having specific questions and specific examples for the people that you're talking to is, that's, I mean, that's the best possible way to go at an interview. And we included a little resource in here. Um, we'll, we'll hopefully be able to share this out later on with um, to help you practice by recording a video on your phone or Zoom to just kind of get comfortable with um, you know, telling your story, your two to three minute, minute elevator pitch, doing those, those star answers with the examples from your background, just getting really comfortable with that because the last thing you want to do is get some question where it's like, hey, tell me about a time you failed. And you're just like, uh... You want to have something in your back pocket to be able to kind of answer that question quickly. And, and when, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go, you gonna finish? Or I just uh, yeah, I was just gonna say the same using same questions and same examples for every stage of the interview process that shows up in the feedback portion of uh, at the end of the interview process. Like when all of us are meeting and discussing your uh, our feedback from our conversations with you, you know that might come up of like, oh, they use that exact same example with me. Oh, and me, and me. And again, it just doesn't give us a good encapsulation of you and what you're capable of doing. It gives us one data point of what you can contribute when we're trying to find ideally like five or six. Um, and also same with the questions of like, if they're not, if you're not asking a lot of questions, it's like, if you're just asking about parking and hours, it doesn't show a lot of interest. Like those are important questions, but it doesn't show a lot of interest or investment in the company as well. Yeah. So Caitlin, before I get into the comp part. No, you're good. I was just going to add on the sharing stories about you. I think it's helpful to keep like a win, a win record or like your own Google doc that you have. I'd also keep a spreadsheet with all the jobs that you're applying to or the companies that you're interested in to keep momentum, but keep a win record. You know, when you are participating in a project or when you do have a win so that when you do have interviews, you can easily look back at that and it will help jog your memory because it is hard to like, you know, we work all the time. We're like involved in things. It's hard to like pull up memory sometimes of, um, you know, all the great contributions that um, you've, could, you've uh, given to the organization. So I definitely keep something going like throughout your career of just some of your wins and highlights. Yeah, that's a great tip. Yeah, I mean, having it like, I mean, when I was going through my interview process with Seekout, I was like, geez, I've been recruiting for 10 years and I can't think of a single story to share with people. Like you got to have that stuff ready to go. So anything you can do to help with your memory on that stuff is super beneficial. Um, and then the last bullet point here is talking about compensation. So I think that's such a hot button topic when you go into the interview process. And um, we could probably do an entire separate call just talking about compensation and how to go through that process, like the negotiations and everything like that. But 
Um, what I just wanted to touch on first and foremost is salary or uh, compensation visibility is here. Like you, there's a lot of states now like California, Washington, um, where you can go on to job boards and see what salary bands are for positions now. And it's with that, it's just kind of continuing to lower the veil of what, what companies are paying. And I encourage candidates all the time to kind of think about that the same way. There is nothing beneficial about being cagey, in particular with salary. Because the biggest thing is with salary, that's one of those few things where it's like, yeah, you might tell me that you're comfortable with taking a 40% pay cut, but me as a recruiter who cares about humans and what happens to them, my brain immediately goes to, okay, that means you're taking a 40% pay cut on childcare, rent, food, um, entertainment, whatever it may be. Like you have to, you have to think about that, that salary is one of those things that I encourage people to kind of plant your feet and plant them pretty hard into the ground on that. And obviously you can have a little bit of variability to that. Like if it's a little bit less than what you were previously making and you're comfortable with it, sure, that's great. But if we're talking about a sizable difference, all that does is future state and make you a flight risk or at minimum unhappy in your role. And I know it's easy to kind of dismiss that as like, okay, if I just went through a layoff, I just need to get a job. I'm not worried about taking a pay cut. I need to get a job. It's like, yes, but eventually, hopefully, the economy will rewrite itself and we'll start to see people getting hired in droves again. And with that, you're going to be in a position where it's like maybe a year, two years from now, if you took a 40% pay cut, somebody else is going to pay you what you rightfully deserve and what you've been making previously. And that, again, that makes you a flight risk. So it doesn't help either side to be cagey about the salary conversation. And I also encourage you to kind of think about like, what are some other non-negotiables for you? You know, I'm not necessarily saying like 401k or bonuses and things like that. I, I mean, those are things that if it is a, an, a it's a uh, non-negotiable for you, like power to you, but I think more like benefits. Like if you have a family, like what do you need from a benefits perspective for um, healthcare and vision and dental and things like that? Because those are the things that I kind of lump as a recruiter into a bucket of like, that's your livelihood. That's stuff that's going to impact your day-to-day -day livelihood. There are other components from a total compensation standpoint that can be negotiated later on. So it's, you know, if you get to offer stage and you find out that a company doesn't do a 401k match, okay, that's your opportunity to negotiate. Like, hey, I, I previously had a 401k match program. It was like 50% up to 4%, whatever it may be. Um, you guys don't have that. Is there any way that we could bake in like $4,000 into my salary or like a sign on bonus so I can contribute that to an IRA? So I have some type of an investment strategy, anything that you can do with those later negotiations and validate with previous benefits or incentivizations that you had that you maybe no longer have, that's how you negotiate. But the salary piece, that is what's going to dictate your day-to-day -day livelihood. And it's one of the things where a good recruiter is advocating for you just as much as their company. And we want to build an offer that's going to keep you around. We don't want to build you an offer that's going to keep you around for six months. So I'm going to get off my soapbox from that one. <laughs> I have a question on that. Yeah. So I know we've talked a lot about in the past about, you know, people from underrepresented groups, myself as a, a black woman, like I can, you know, it's safe to assume that in prior roles, I've been underpaid or, you know, maybe I'm making 20% less, or maybe it's not that drastic, but, um, I might be hesitant to give you a target for fear that I'm like lowballing myself or it's under what the range is. So would you say it's okay? Like if we were on the phone, if I asked you, you know, like as a recruiter, what is your, or your company, what's your philosophy on compensation? Like if I share a number with you and it's, drastically under the range? Will you let me know or will you, you know, offer me what I asked for? Yeah. So great question. So I'll say a, a really good recruiter should be able to have like a very candid conversation of where it's like a, Hey, look, like, yeah, you, what you're asking for from a compensation perspective is drastically lower than what we're targeting for this role based on your experience level. If it's the type of thing of maybe you only have like one to two years of experience and you're applying for a senior level role, I might tell you like, hey, look, like maybe at a senior level, like this role might not be the best fit, but we are flexible with hiring this as like a non-senior level function. And you would be a great fit for that. And even within that band, we're still going to be higher than what your compensation ask is going to be. Like you should be able to have that comfortable dialogue as a recruiter and a candidate. 
And also just with this, this pay visibility piece, it, there's, there's so much power kind of given back with that for candidates to be able to like have that information ready to go to where if you have no baseline knowledge of what a role should pay, like say you're pivoting to a new industry or um, a new job title or whatever it may be, you can go look at that. There's also tools like PayScale and things like that, where you can get some research into where you should be able to look at like, okay, even if I'm getting paid 30% less than what the market rate is for this role, I now know roughly what that should be. And that's now my quote going forward. And again, if I, as a recruiter, I'm like, you know what, that's a little bit outside of our pay band or like, Hey, for this role, that's, you know, that's kind of at the high end. We're probably closer to like this. Like that, it should be a fluid conversation regardless. But again, for underrepresented groups, like looking at that information as much as you can, going in equipped with that and being comfortable asking for that. I know that's easier said than done. That's that's the best way to, to get that conversation going. So perfect. Um, and we can go to the next and final slide. All right, so I'll just run through this really quickly. I'm sure this is kind of basic knowledge for a lot of folks, but you know, new world is is that most interviews are done over Zoom. So kind of just some tips and tricks to make sure that once you get to these interviews that you're doing it effectively. Um, again, be prepared to introduce yourself, have a good like two to three minute um, elevator pitch. And again, the biggest thing is with Zoom interviews, it's like, the, it's a finite time. You have like that 30 to 45 minute window, sometimes as long as an hour, but typically going to be like that 30 to 45 minutes. So use that first two to three minutes to just do an elevator pitch, use your examples to kind of add some additional color to your experience and background. And then lastly, like make sure that you have some really good, you have some time to ask your really good questions that you've built out. Um, Find a quiet space with good internet. I know that's easier said than done. A lot of folks have families or their, you know, their house isn't accommodating for that, but whatever you can do to find just a quiet space with good internet um, to make sure that you're not interrupted or losing time in your conversations to make sure that you're having an effective dialogue. Um, you know, go to a hotel where they have like those little conference rooms, like go to a friend's house, go to a family member's house, whatever it may be, just finding that space for your conversations. Um, using headphones is great, especially if you don't have a particularly quiet place, um, just to try to block out as much external noise as you can. And also blurring your background is huge for, for Zoom interviews. I, I highly recommend if y'all don't have that as a default setting, do so immediately. For instance, right behind me, there is a mountain of just junk. Um, so that, but you can't see it because it's blurred out. So just highly recommend everybody do that. Um, Test your Zoom prior to the interview. Zoom updates like every other day. So making sure that you have the most recent update um, and you're not having to download it because you don't want to show up to the call frazzled and, and worried about, you know, how you're five minutes late because Zoom was doing an update. Um, ensure you have the correct screen name. Um, I think that during COVID, a lot of us used Zoom for more personal reasons, like, you know, friend happy hours or just like get togethers and things like that. So make sure you have like your full name on there. If you're comfortable with putting your pronouns on there as well, um, you, you don't want to show up there with like party animal 21 as your screen name or something. Um, and then lastly, have your questions and examples written down. Um, I don't, a lot of us don't have two dual screens. If you have that power to you, you can just have all your stuff written down on there, but have it written down on a piece of paper. So you're not worried about flipping between screens. You kind of want to be locked in on, on the Zoom call and not uh, not fidgeting back and forth. So, um, and then yeah, that's that's really it. So we'll we'll open it up for for Q and A. But thank thanks everybody for listening. Andy, I have a suspicion that what was it? Party Animal Twenty One. Twenty. I think that was your AOL screen name back in the day. Or something. Mine's way more embarrassing. I'll tell you, <laughs> not on live. Awesome. Um, there was one question about a recruiter versus an HR generalist with heavy recruiting background. Um, I would say just if you do have a role and you're doing multiple things that aren't really encapsulated in your job title, just make sure that those things are highlighted. And if you were like an HR generalist, you're looking to move to a recruiter, even on your resume, you can say, you know, HR generalist slash recruiter or bring that work to the forefront. You know, as long as you've actually been doing that work, make sure that it's highlighted because recruiters are looking at things quickly. They'll see that and they'll want to have a 
in uh, uh, exploratory conversation. So I think that's helpful. It's easy as you can make it to like, you know, for someone to be able to quickly scan and like, and hone in on your experience, the better. Yeah, if you actually go to my LinkedIn profile, that happened to me. I was an HR generalist, but was basically a recruiter. So it says like recruiter slash HR generalist. So, And if you're going the other way, I would just highlight the projects or work that you've been involved in as a recruiter. If you've worked cross-functionally at all with people on other teams or, you know, any anything you've done in some of the other disciplines, um, that would be great to highlight. Awesome. Well, this was fun. What do you think? Yeah. Our first LinkedIn Live. Yeah, this was great. I I mean, I haven't been seeing what's going on on LinkedIn. I'm just on the Zoom screen, but seems like it went well. <laughs>